In the name of God who loves us and calls us to respond, amen. Please be seated. Good morning, beloved. Happy Feast of the Epiphany and Happy New Year to you all. I hope you have all been blessed in some way by this season, perhaps been able to share it with someone meaningful in your life, perhaps given or received gifts. Any good gifts this year? I must admit that gift giving and receiving are not my strengths. They're kind of intimidating for me. I pray every year that the right gift will just knock me over the head so that it's so plain and obvious to me. I tend to overthink these things, right? Or I struggle to find the right gift for the right person. Gift receiving can be just as challenging, right? The other side of the coin. Because there's always that gift that either immediately becomes a candidate for re-gifting or only seems to ever come out when my mother-in-law is visiting. Some of this, of course, pardon the pun, is wrapped up in our story today, right? The Magi who, by tradition, bring these most elegant, idealized gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. No wonder I don't know what to get for anyone. Now, of course, we sing that this is the most wonderful time of the year, and yet it's about this time when the residue of the magic of the season might start to fade for us. Classes will start tomorrow. School, travel for work picks up again, and the routines of retirement, however full or not, set in again, just with less Hallmark movies in the background. So we could hear the story of the epiphany in a way we have before, the dawn of the new light, the star that led the Magi, those wise ones from the East, their mysterious arrival and their daring escape. But I wanted to share a different experience of Epiphany this morning for all of you who, like me, struggle at gift giving and receiving. This is Henry Van Dyke's Midrash of the fourth Magi. Has anyone ever heard this story of the other Wise man? Artaban? At least one. Good. So Artaban was one of the Magi, and he was living in Persia. Along with his other learned companions, he had searched the sacred text as to the time when the king should be born. They knew that a new star would appear, and they agreed ahead of time that Artaban would watch it from his home in Persia, and the others would observe the sky where they were in Babylon. Artaban went out to his roof to watch the night sky, and when the star appeared, they would wait for him ten days to arrive to Babylon before going on to follow the star. He had made ready for this journey, his life's journey, by selling all of his possessions, and he had decided that he would acquire three precious jewels to present to the new king, a sapphire, a ruby, and a pearl. At nightfall, having seen the star and headed toward Babylon, on the tenth day, Artaban approached the outskirts of the city. And his horse scented a difficulty and slackened her pace. And sure enough, there the dim starlight revealed a, a man stricken and lying on the roadway. His skin bore the mark of fever, and his Artaban went to go around him, a sigh he could hear came from the man's lips. Artaban felt sorry that he couldn't stay to minister to this dying stranger, but this was indeed the hour for which his entire life had been directed. He could not forfeit the reward of his years of study and faith to do this single act of human mercy. But the more he thought about it, how could he leave this man to suffer and to die alone? And so he took off his robe and he began a work of healing. Several hours later, this man regained some consciousness and Artaban left him with water and supplies and a note instructions for his care. 
And though Artaban rode with the greatest haste the rest of the way to Babylon, he would arrive too late. For the others left a note for him. We have waited till past midnight, but can wait no longer. Please follow us, af- follow after us across the desert. So Artaban sat down in despair and he covered his face with his hands. How can I cross the desert with no food or supplies and a spent horse? Eventually he decided he must sell one of his jewels, the sapphire, to acquire the necessary camels and provisions for the journey. Only the merciful God knows whether or not I shall lose my purpose because I tarried to show mercy. Several days later, when Artaban arrived at Bethlehem, the streets were deserted. The door of one dwelling was open, and as he drew near, Artaban could hear a mother singing a lullaby to her young son. He entered, and he introduced himself, and the woman told him that it was now the third day since wise men had come to this village. They had found Joseph and Mary and their young child and had laid extravagant gifts at their feet, but seemed to had left just as mysteriously as they came. In fact, that very night, she told him, Joseph took his young family and fled, some say, all the way to Egypt. And while she was telling him this, suddenly there was commotion in the streets. Women were shrieking, desperate cries were heard, the soldiers of Herod Herod are killing our children. Artaban went to the doorway, and sure enough, a band of soldiers was running through the houses of the town. And the captain approached the door of this house where Artaban was, nudging Artaban to move out of the way, but he did not stir, instead revealing in an outstretched hand another of his jewels, a ruby. And he said, I am waiting to give this jewel to a prudent captain who will go on his way and leave this house alone. The captain, amazed of the gem, took it and told to his men, March on, there are no children here. Then Artaban prayed, O God, forgive me my sin, for I have spent for men that which was meant for God. Shall I ever be worthy to see the face of the king? But the voice of the woman, weeping for joy in the shadows of her house, said softly, Thou hast saved the life of my little one. May the Lord bless thee, and may the Lord keep thee and give thee peace. Artaban, still following the king, decided he would go on down to Egypt, seeking everywhere or anywhere for traces of this little family. For many years, We follow Artaban in his search, and we see him at the pyramids, and we see him in Alexandria consulting a a Hebrew rabbi, taking counsel with him, who told him perhaps to seek the king not among the rich, but among the poor. He passed through countries where famine lay heavy upon the land, and the people cried out for bread. He made his dwelling in plague-stricken cities among the sick. He visited the oppressed and those captive in prisons. He searched the crowded slave markets, and though he found no one to worship, he found many to serve. As the years passed, he fed the hungry, he clothed the naked, he healed the sick, he comforted the captive. Thirty-three years had now passed away since Artaban had began his search. His hair was falling out, turning white as snow, and he knew his life's end was near. He made his way back to Jerusalem, and as he entered the city, he inquired because there was a large crowd that was leaving the city gates, heading towards Golgotha. Someone told him, two robbers are to be crucified today, and there's a third, a man named Jesus of Nazareth, who it is said performed many miracles and wonders among the people. He claimed to be the Son of God, and the priests and the elders have decided that he should die, and Pilate has approved. How strangely these 
familiar words fell upon Artaban. For they had led him for a lifetime over sea and land. And now they came to him again like a message of despair. For this king of his had been denied and cast out. But slowly Artaban's heart started beating within him. He thought, it may be that I shall yet find this king and be able to ransom him from death by giving the last of my jewels, the pearl, to his enemies in exchange for his life. So he started to follow the crowds toward the hilltop. He saw on his way a troop of soldiers coming down the street, dragging a sobbing young woman And as an Artaban paused for them to go by, she broke away from her tormentors and she threw herself at his feet. She threw her arms around his knees and said, have pity on me, save me, for my father was also of the Magi, but he is dead and I'm to be sold as a slave to pay for his debts. Artaban trembled as he again felt the tension arise in him. It was the same that he had experienced in the palm grove right outside of Babylon and in the cottage there in Bethlehem. Twice the gift which he had consecrated to the king had been drawn from his hand in service to humanity. Would he now fail again? He found himself taking the pearl and laying it in the hand of this young daughter saying, Daughter, this is the ransom. It is the last of my treasures, which I had hoped to give to the king. And as she handed the payment to the soldiers, the darkness of the sky started to overwhelm them, and suddenly the uh, the shuddering tremors of the earthquake ran through the ground. The soldiers fled in terror, and Artaban and this young woman got to the closest wall to take shelter. What had he to fear? What had he to hope for? He had given away the last of his tribute to the king. The quest was over and he had failed. What else mattered? The earthquake quivered on and a heavy tile shaken from a roof fell and struck Artaban on the head. He keeled over and he lay breathless and pale. And suddenly to him there came a still, small voice through the twilight. It was like a distant music. The girl he had just rescued leaned over and heard him say, Not so, my lord, for when did you hunger and I fed you? Or thirst and I gave you something to drink? When were you sick or in prison and I came to visit you? Thirty-three years have I looked for you, but I have never seen your face, nor ministered unto you, my king. The sweet voice came again. Truly I say unto you, that inasmuch as you have done any of this to the least of these who are my people, you have done it unto me. A calm radiance of wonder and joy lighted the face of Artaban as he took one long, last breath, exhaled gently from his lips. His journey was ended. His treasure was accepted. The other wise men had found his king. Now, it could be, beloved, that you were like the wise men that Matthew talks about in our reading this morning. Your good gifts made it to the manger in a timely way. But your epiphany story, your experience of this holiday could be a little less magical than that. Perhaps sometimes, like Artaban, we start out thinking we must get the right gift, right place, right person and all. But perhaps this story reminds us that God's arrival frees us from the illusion of such perfection and invites us to join the confounding, world-overturning, saving grace that is God's own 
perfect, complete, and whole gift to a humanity he was willing to be born into as the least of these. And so long after the magic of Christmas tide fades away, may we find that it is in giving away our perfect gifts for such as these that we, with Artaban, receive the calm radiance of wonder and joy that is also the epiphany story. Not that we feel we deserve, but perhaps just the one we might need. Amen.